So thank you again for joining us for our, our bi-weekly research and progress webinar series. My name is Karen Tamat. I'm the program manager at Systems for Action. And if you're not familiar with us, we're a, a national research program office of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And we, we fund um, studies all across the nation that test novel strategies for helping delivery systems and medical social and public services work better together with the goal of advancing health equity and population health outcomes. So this bi-weekly webinar series is a great opportunity for everyone to hear from the research studies being conducted through our program. You can hear about their experiences in conducting their study and what they're learning so far. So today, the research team that we're gonna be hearing from is based at the Stanford School of Medicine and they're joined by their research partner, um, Healthy Alliance. So this is one of our newest projects and this is their first time presenting in our webinar series on their project titled, Integrating Health and Social Services Through Novel Independent Practice Associations, excuse me. So theirs was one of three research studies funded out of our call for proposals that we released in 2021, looking for innovative solutions to address what we call the wrong pocket problem. Um, and they had an explicit focus on racial equity. So the research team will tell you a little bit more about their solution in this presentation, but first I'll go over some housekeeping and introduce our presenters. So we're here in our welcome portion, and after that I'll hand over the reins to our research presenters. We have Jonathan Shaw, Todd Wagner, and Elena Rosenbaum, and after they're finished with their research presentation, they'll hand over the reins to our commentary, who is um, Kyla Schmidt from MomStart. And then after that, we'll have probably 10 to 15 minutes for our Q&A. So if you have any questions at any point throughout this webinar, please feel free to locate the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and enter in your question. And we'll make sure that we address that at the end of today's session. And then also we do record today's webinar and we'll send out the recording and the slides after today's session. With that, we have Jonathan Shaw, Dr. Shaw is an associate chair for the community partnership in Stanford's Department of Medicine. He's also um, a family physician at Ravenswood Family Health Center, which is a federally qualified health center. And he's involved at Stanford's Evaluation Sciences Unit on a multi multidisciplinary team focused on implementation science. Joining him, we have Todd Wagner, who is a health economist and professor in Stanford School of Medicine. He has a joint appointment as director of the Health Economics Resource, Resource Center at the Palo Alto VA. And then we have um, someone from their partner organization. We have Elena Rosenbaum, at, uh, who is the medical director at Healthy Alliance, which is an upstate New York organization focused on coordinating social, behavioral, and clinical services to enable people to lead healthy lives and reduce health disparities. And then we'll have commentary from Kyla Schmidt, who is the founder and executive, executive director at Mom, Start, Mom Starts Here, which is a nonprofit organization serving mothers and parents in need in upstate New York. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then, um, Jonathan, I believe you're going to share your screen and progress the slides for your team. Great, thank you so much. It's a real privilege to be here with uh, Healthy Alliance, our partners from Healthy Alliance and with Kyla. Uh, and first, I just wanna thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the S4A team for funding this work and allowing us to partner with Healthy Alliance, between Stanford and Healthy Alliance to, to evaluate their novel uh, innovation. So I'll start by defining the wrong pocket problem briefly and, and going through some possible solutions. And then I'll hand it over to our partner, Elena, to discuss specifically Healthy Alliance as an organizational innovation as one solution to the wrong pocket problem. And then hand it over to my co-PI, Todd, who will go over our study goals and our methods. We were funded by RWJ specifically to study an innovation solution to the wrong pocket problem. And this phenomena occurs when one organization won't fund a program that is socially beneficial because the returns come to another organization. Or in other words, the return on investment goes to a different pocket. So an example of a wrong pocket problem, over the past two decades, increasing evidence, amounting evidence shows that substance use treatment is cost effective. Paradoxically, at the same time, there's been a large contraction in substance use treatment programs in the US. So why, 
substance use treatment is cost effective because it leads to savings in criminal justice, but the investments don't pay for themselves. Those are easy to cut from the healthcare system's perspective because those returns on investment aren't going to their sector, they're going to criminal justice. There's also strong examples in transportation being key to making it to healthcare and, and better health outcomes, but again, those sectors don't share the returns on investment. So Stuart Butler, uh, from a multi-sector perspective, uh, explored this wrong pocket issue and how it hurts health uh, in this 2018 article and laid out several areas and needs and ways forward. And one is we can expand and refine the research demonstrating and really making the case between the relationship between social investments and improved health. Another approach would be to break down the silos between government agencies and their budgets, so really address the wrong pocket by maybe combining pockets. Uh, and the last is, are there new organizational models that would mitigate the problem and realign incentives? So starting with, with the first one, the idea that research could get us there, um, social factors, I mean, for this group, I'm sure is aware that the immense amount of uh, research now showing that social factors are more important than genetics or medical care. So what I spend my time doing as a, as a um, physician accounts for maybe 20% at best of outcomes when we look at mortality or long-term health outcomes. The vast majority is now uh, clearly, uh, the evidence clearly shows social behavioral factors, environmental factors are much more important in determining long-term outcomes like mortality. Also increasingly is recognized the importance of, of early lifehood from, from infancy, structural uh, aspects like poverty, discrimination have long-term effects on, on health outcomes decades later. So the evidence is there, but the policy has not caught up. So across um, a range of disciplines, we now know that the literature is there, the research is there, but that hasn't gotten us to policy change. Um, but the discussion really has advanced. And you know, I won't go through the definition of social determinants of health because I think everyone is familiar with it, but some examples, important examples, food security, transportation, educational access, social inclusion and connection, and structural racism are increasingly recognized as being key to health outcomes. So this awareness and discussion has really advanced over the past decade but it hasn't gotten us to the funding being there uh, for social services. So the second option uh, or way forward that Butler highlighted was breaking down silos. He suggested we can work to uh, have government agencies and their budgets um, less separated. And that might work, um, but it also might backfire. And so I'll, I'll get to how that backfire might happen in a second. But first, I wanna talk about why we as medical systems and healthcare providers don't invest in social determinants of health. It's difficult for healthcare organizations to credibly estimate the full net benefits of these investments. These are very long-term investments and the return may come decades later in terms of health outcomes. And healthcare organizations often doubt whether social services can be delivered efficiently, either them by, by themselves or they lack a familiarity and trust in the local social services ecosystem. It's really different cultures. You know, we physicians talk about patients, social services talk about clients, and and there's very little interprofessional interaction between the, the two uh, realms. And healthcare organizations are also worried about adverse selection and patient churn. So, you know, do they really want to invest in being seen as providing robust social services and attracting the most medically and socially complex patients who may then cost more? And patient churn in terms of investing in long-term social service uh, interventions that will have return on investment decades later when your average patient enrollment in your system or insurance may only be two to three years. So breaking down silos might be a solution, but in our very high cost healthcare system, um, it's probably not the way we wanna go. Healthcare is more regulated, more expensive than any other sector. And so, you know, for example, housing, do we really want to finance housing through healthcare? and bring it up to the highest common denominator or any other social service, probably not in our current system. So this brings us to the important question of how can we rearrange or innovate uh, the system? And, and as we do that specifically we wanna look at which social services most directly improve health outcomes 
in a way that actually sell, saves healthcare resources. And one area this, this could happen is if it empowers better management of individuals' health conditions, for example, asthma or diabetes, thus avoiding exacerbations that require urgent or emergent intervention. And that might show immediate or intermediate uh, return on investment. And as we look at this, we also have to think about what innovations are best to link the social and health care services in, a, in um, ongoing and uh, effective way. One important thing to keep in mind is the wrong pocket problem is particularly important uh, from a health equity perspective because it, it truly affects persons who have complex needs and rely on social services and healthcare organizations. And Medicaid, as the safety net, the largest safety net provider in our, our country, has started to put a lot, of, lot more attention on addressing social determinants of health. And increasingly, states and counties are exploring using Medicaid waivers to expand how they address social determinants of health. And so this map shows one example, the, the Medicaid health home model, which uh, integrates behavioral and medical health for patients with multiple chronic conditions. It's been adopted in 21 states and over 30 different uh, programs. And it adds, um, it enhances federal funding uh, for these uh, models, which include social determinants. So that's just one example. But beyond nudging uh, Medicaid to cover social services and, and expand beyond just direct medical care, are there other more uh, innovative organizational models and solutions to the wrong pocket problem? And that's where we come to Healthy Alliance as, a, as an organizational and financing model that is one approach that may uh, solve this problem. So with that, I'll hand it over to Elena to talk more about Healthy Alliance. Thank you, Jonathan, so much. Uh, appreciate um, Stanford University's assistance here, the research team and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, so Healthy Alliance was founded in 2018, um, originally funded through the uh, DISRIP in New York State through the waiver program. It's a sister organization of Healthy Alliance. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when to proceed. Thank you. It's a sister organization to the Healthy Alliance PPS. Um, and the, during the DISRIP period, uh, the goal was really to reduce ED hospitalizations um, as a way to reduce cost um, to Medicaid um, recipients to the health services. So uh, many of the programs that were developed during this time period were social care in nature. And at one point, um, Alliance for Better Health brought together community members um, and different stakeholders and asked them, so what do you think would be a good way to improve the health of people in our community? And um, uh, they, they thought about a way to connect individuals who um, were being seen in health settings to social services out in the community. And so out of this was born the Social Determinants of Health Network, um, where we have connected social care providers, behavioral health providers, and health providers um, using a closed loop referral platform. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, this work started in the original six counties of the PPS and has now um, Healthy Alliance now manages 22 counties in New York State, along with um, some central New York and Adirondack partners. Um, and the IPA, the Independent Practice Association, was founded as a sustainability solution, basically to help secure funding uh, for the programs uh, on an ongoing basis after uh, the district uh, funding had been um, completed. So um, in this case, the IPA would function as a trusted broker and solve some of the issues that Jonathan was just talking about um, in his earlier slides. N next slide, please. So at the foundation is, is not just a uh, closed loop referral platform infrastructure. Uh, Healthy Alliance also provides other services that really center on improving the health of individuals in the community by supporting uh, social care providers as well as uh, health healthcare and uh, MCOs in, um, in uh, reaching their goals. So just as an example, uh, the referral navigation is that, you know, we have a closed loop referral platform partner with Unite Us, yet some organizations may not know exactly which is the best um, social care provider that might meet the needs of the individual that they have in front of them. So our referral team um, identifies, helps identify which is the best 
uh, referral and uh, makes this process smooth for the community member. Next slide, please. So again, as I mentioned, there's really benefits to each of the stakeholders. Over the next few slides, I'll go through each. So next slide, please. Um, for managed care organizations, um, there's a uh, New York State Department of Health requirement to address social determinants of health in some of their uh, contracts. And managed care organizations recognize the impact of social deter determinants of health on individuals, on their members' health, as well as in cost. So they want to do the right thing here and would like to uh, provide funding with the ability to track referrals and find out what is happening when the members um, go to the organization to get the services. They want to make sure that the members are getting quality services and that the social care organizations are able to meet the regulatory standards both for data management, privacy, as well as um, performance metrics. So the trusted broker, the Healthy Alliance, can help um, address all of these needs. In addition, instead of contracting individually with um, each uh, community-based organization in the community, MCOs can go to the Healthy Alliance to contract for a diverse array of service providers. The, you know, there may be one or two community organizations that are able to uh, meet the regulatory requirements by the health plans, um, but that limits what they can offer their members. And so the social determinants of health network allows for greater diversity in services that will be uh, present for the members. Thank you. The healthcare organizations, on the other hand, the medical providers, behavioral health providers, they have a deep understanding of the impact of social um, unmet social needs on individuals' uh, health and life. And so they've been wanting to uh, find a way to help individuals and um, they understand the importance of screening for social determinants of health. However, as with any other screen that we um, employ as a, as a healthcare provider, we understand we need a solution. We need to be able to do something once we uncover a uh, challenge. Um, and so the Healthy Alliance Social Determinants of Health Network uh, allows healthcare providers and behavioral health providers to make referrals once they uncover that there's an unmet social need um, for the individual. And typically, this kind of referral used to happen through sticky notes. You know, please go to the food pantry. This is the dates of the pantry. But now, uh, these organizations can actually track what's happening with their patients as they're uh, being. Uh, refer to uh, other outside organizations. So that's to ensure quality services. Um, and for social care providers, the IPA is beneficial uh, because they uh, get support in terms of what, how to get uh, manage their data. Again, the same privacy issues, regulatory issues that uh, the MCO expects, as well as ability to facilitate contracting and um, the promise and the goal of sustainable funding that could occur if we had um, willing uh, payers. In addition, that you know, social care providers refer to behavioral health and healthcare organizations. Um, thank you. Next slide. So, as I mentioned before, the six original uh, counties of Alliance for Better Health were the original network. We've expanded up. Uh, north with our Adirondack partners and help manage that part of the network as well as uh, into the um, uh, central New York. And uh, so we're now up to 22 counties. Just briefly mention that um, as we're going through this research with uh, the Stanford research team, you know, we're thinking about the, the, the control groups and, you know, how do we, there's been some work along the way in different, in all the counties in New York State in terms of DESREP. And there are Unitas coverage, um, you'll see some of the light blue is uh, expanding. And so the data that we're collecting is up until 2021 and Todd will talk more about that. Um, and so we, we have more insight into what's happening in our counties, but we're also trying to understand through the process of which would be the best counties to look at as control groups. So for just a quick overview of um, the network. 
Uh, we now have over 500 organizations that are managed by Healthy Alliance in 22 counties, as I mentioned. And there's about 2,000 monthly requests for connection. Um, and there's a whole set of programming. Uh, next slide, please. So you'll see that there's um, a lot of different service types, as well as subservice types that more specifically meet, meet the need of um, individuals. We know that people have at least two unmet social needs generally. And um, so they can um, make, ref you can make referrals in the platform for multiple different service types at the same time. Next slide, please. And so one other thing I just wanted to quickly mention is that as we go into a community and start mapping out what um, organizations and what services are available, we go through this process of a market analysis to really try to understand what the gaps are in the community, what are the disparities and what, um, and, and what are the needs and et cetera of, of folks so that we can provide a uh, diverse array of services and engage the organizations that are of all different sizes and um, different types. And then just, uh, I think the last slide is really just talking about um, governance. Um, and uh, we, there was, you know, there's this question of how do we get different sectors to work with each other and different stakeholders. And so the governance structure of Healthy Alliance sets up that uh, by making sure that we have social care providers alongside healthcare organizations um, steering the organization and the, uh, both the priorities and the goals. And next slide, please. And then um, in addition to the network, you know, Healthy Alliance works with um, the public health and other community organizations through initiatives that are specifically targeting um, health equity. So as an example, um, we uh, steered, uh, fund, we sought funding from, you know, as a trusted broker from health plans, health care organizations in a uh, COVID-19 vaccine pre-registration initiative that sought to um, create um, equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines in the community. And um, our community organizations played a, a very important role in being in, out there with community members getting pre-registered. Our um, health court organizations also participated. And as I mentioned, both the health plans and the healthcare organizations provided funding and the county health led the, um, for the county uh, public health initiative. And another example is a joint funding program with uh, United Way and, and um, trying to uh, increase the support for BIPOC-led CBOs in our community. And so these are, again, we're, we're constantly seeking opportunities, but these are a couple of examples we wanted to share. Thank you. I think that's, uh, I next hand it over to Todd. Thanks. Can you go back a slide, Jonathan? Looks like there's one slide missing. We should have a slide that talks about our aims. Um, so I'm Todd Wagner. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Carrington mentioned, we were just funded uh, at the end of last year. So we have um, what we're going to talk about for the next seven slides or so is our methods and our framework for doing this, but we don't have results yet. So you can go on to the next slide. So here are the three aims that we're looking at. The first aim is really to understand the effect on total costs. And we'll explain sort of uh, uh, the silos that we're looking at here, but what we wanna show is that, uh, does this healthy alliance system that Elena was just talking about have an effect on healthcare costs that might help us um, get more sustainability for such a system like this? Aim two really digs into some of the mechanisms or trying to understand some of the mechanisms. Do we see a decrease in emergency room or emergency department utilization, for example, that might give us insights in inappropriate care? And then aim three, again, gets into these questions of, uh, can we do some subsample analyses to look at the kinds of services they're using and what about health equity? Does that apply across the spectrum of people in the, in the services? So here's our conceptual model or framework. If you track this from left to right, you see the very siloed 
uh, approach that each uh, system takes. So you have the healthcare system, which has these federated data systems that are very good, but only if you're interested in healthcare per se. Um, um, you end up with the public health system, which is really interested in sort of population health um, and the allocation of uh, taxpayer funds, but it, it struggles to, to connect across the different groups. And then you get the social services, which um, is much more of a patchwork, if you will, and struggle with data systems. And one of the things that we're trying to pull together here is all three of these, you know, with data and systems and, uh, and governance, which has been incredibly rewarding. So after I'm done, you'll hear from Kyla, which is one of the, the people that we've met through this process, um, who's going to talk a lot about sort of the, her role in the organization and the governance that she sees in this process. Next slide. So the methodological approach that we hope to take for this is known as a difference in difference design. So I'll tell you about the data that we're going to use in a second. But the idea is that we're going to have intervention sites, if you will. These are the counties in which Healthy Alliance um, participates in, and that's the top row. And we're going to have that before Healthy Alliance existed, which is before 2018, and after Healthy Alliance existed. And for our main outcome, what we're going to estimate here really is the average cost per member per month in the healthcare costs. And then we're going to probably spend a fair amount of our time looking at the controls because we need control counties and control people in those control counties. And again, we're going to estimate the same things and estimated uh, per member per month cost in those as well. So we'll do that both unadjusted and then statistically with, with adjustment. Next slide. So the, we're going to rely on two data sets. Um, we're greatly supported by New York having an all pair claims data um, that go back many, many years. And we can get great data from 2011 onwards that allow us understandings of what's happening for all patients in uh, New York. So that data set is known as Sparks, um, and we'll use that as our primary uh, denominator for all the things we're doing. We're then going to merge it with this Healthy Alliance member and services file, this Unite Us file, which will pull in specific information about the services that the, the cases are receiving. Next slide. So just to be more specific on the cases, the cases will include persons in Unite Us database during the 2019 to 21 timeframe that live in six surface counties, Albany, Rensselaer, Schenectady, Fulton, Montgomery, and Saratoga. Um, we're then gonna merge this with our Sparks data. And I should note that Unite Us does not have the SSN. So we're requesting all the approvals to do a probabilistic match based on more information for the names and date of birth and gender and, and so forth to, to get as close a match as we can. Next slide. I think what we're most struggling with, oops, if you go back one, I think what we're, oops, there should be the controls. There we go. I think what we're most struggling with is the, well, the controls, not the counties of the controls, but the good case, good examples of people in those control counties. So we have um, comparable New York counties that we'll use and we've identified through census data. Um, those counties have the same service providers that are part of United Us. If they do have those, we'll exclude them. So we, we recognize that there's a fair amount of natural sort of uh, organization that happens at the county level that we're learning about. And if they look too much like our, our intervention sites, we'll exclude those counties. And then we're gonna try to match using some statistical propensity score methods, uh, identify who are gonna be good control candidates in those counties. And for those of you not familiar with the B24 risk score, it's just the method by which CMS pays for Medicare Advantage. So it's a, it's a risk adjuster. Next slide. So the, again, just going back to the three aims, we're gonna look at the total cost of care in the SPARCS data. They don't report uh, payments, they report total charges, what we'll cost adjust those charges. And again, we'll get into the discussion of emergency room visits, um, hospitalizations, uh, ambulatory services. Um, we also, with, with Sparks, can look at uh, medications. So we can start thinking about ways of, did the services improve uh, adherence to medications? Something that we would think that primary care might have a, a big handle in. And then we'll get into some of the subgroup analysis that we're particularly interested in um, across the deciles of risk, as well as rape estimates. And hopefully that will give us insights onto the vulnerable populations. For our proposal, we were trying to do some power analyses. Um, so what you have on the picture here is the power curve. And let me just walk, walk you through how we created this. 
Um, so as mentioned earlier at the outset, I also have a joint role with the VA, which I think of as another major safety net provider. We took five random samples of veterans under age 65, because that's our cohort here, and then computed their monthly cost. We were trying to get an estimate of how much we think the, the average stable monthly cost is, as well as the variance. And as you can see on the power curve, what I've highlighted in the light blue box rectangle is sort of where we think we are with the number of visits that or encounters that come through um, Healthy Alliance. We think that we're somewhere between a, a 10 and 13% change in total cost is what we have the power to detect, depending on how much of a, 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 a power what level of power you're willing to, to risk here. So if you want to be more conservative at 95% power, we, we can only see about a 12% increase in cost. And then if you're willing to be about 80% power, we can see about a 9% increase in cost. So that's sort of where we are. And that translates for the 9% that translates into about a $60 per member per month savings. So if we, we see a, you know, if these members who go through the system see about a $60, uh, $60 number of month savings, we should be able to detect that. I'd like to hand it over to you. And just a reminder, if you're going through and have questions for us, please write those out and we can address those. If you have more questions about what Jonathan presented or Alana or myself, I'm happy to address those after Kyle speaks. Thank you, Todd. Happy to be here. So I'll tell you a little bit about our organization. At Mom Starts Here, our mission is to connect women in unplanned pregnancies, young mothers, and families in need to the resources in the community that are available to them. We serve the most vulnerable expecting families and parents in the capital region in upstate New York by providing access to life coaching support, wraparound services, a monthly diaper delivery, baby items, safe sleep and travel essentials, resource navigation, and prenatal support for uh, expectant parents and parents in need. Our partnership with Healthy Alliance has aided in so many ways. Um, it's been fantastic to have their support in improving our data management systems. And it's also provided funding opportunities through the IPA that Elena mentioned as well. Working in a network of providers has had a tremendous impact on our work. The ease in which we can send and receive referrals from other community-based organizations allows us to better meet the needs of families we serve. Collaborative opportunities have been born out of the utilization of the network and partnerships have been formed with the crossover clientele that we have with other organizations. For example, we've served hundreds of refugee and immigrant families that are also served by the United States Committee for Refugee and Immigrants or USCRI. Because of the number of referrals that they were sending us within the network, USCRI and Mom Starts Here began discussing more strategic ways to make sure our common clients had what they needed for their children. Recently, this took the form of Mom Starts Here placing a bulk order of essential baby items. So a whole bunch of toddler beds and cribs and pack and plays with the mattresses and car seats, diapers, clothing, everything you would need to properly care for your baby or toddler. We ordered a whole bunch of those items and sent a bulk order to the USCRI offices for pregnant women and parents that were coming from Afghanistan. Um, so all of those families had what they needed when they arrived, which is an incredible arrangement that really wouldn't have been possible. There were ways that we could work smarter together to meet the needs of that vulnerable population. So this kind of collaborative effort um, was really built within the network. And another example of a relationship that we've developed within the network is with the food pantries of the Capital District. While they assist with emergency diaper provision, and they are the area's um, national diaper bank location, they actually assist with emergency diaper provision while we provide a monthly supply on an ongoing basis. So currently when the food pantries receive a, re a referral for emergency diapers, they meet that need and give you know, the family what they need to get by, but then they also automatically enroll that family in our recurring monthly diaper program right on the Unite Us platform. And participation in the network has just added so much value in our ability to provide resource navigation for our clients. We help parents get connected to programs that can assist them well beyond the support that we provide internally. This might mean a bed for an older child, a grade school student that we wouldn't have um, 
you know, the ability to provide a twin mattress for, or assistance with uh, eviction prevention, or legal advocacy, health advocacy, care coordination, and so much more. Utilizing the referral platform, the Unitas referral platform, and referring to other providers in the network allows us to effectively track the progress of the referral to completion because it's a closed loop system. It also makes us more effective navigators as we become aware of the growing programs within the network and allows for more opportunity for partnership. Thank you. Thank you to the research team and Berkyla for providing some commentary on, on the importance of this research project and the impact it can have. So we are here at our Q&A portion for today. We have about 24 minutes. So if anyone has any questions, I invite you to um, open up your Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and, and enter that in and we'll make sure that we address it. I think we have plenty of time here. And then Elena has been very proactive in answering questions. But I'm gonna go ahead and answer or ask some of these out loud so that everyone else can hear the answers. So let's see. Our first question here is from an anonymous attendee and they ask, how did Healthy Alliance get started from the perspective of deciding they were going to implement an IPA and getting their MCOs on board? So Elena, I think I'm gonna address that one to you, but anyone else is welcome to join in on their answer. Thank you, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I think the IPA was set up really to facilitate contracting. It's, um, it's a model that's been used um, by medical professionals in contracting. And so that was, um, it's, the, it's one of the first social care provider uh, entities that functions as, again, an independent practice association. Um, we have ongoing efforts to work with the different um, health plans in our region uh, for contracts and have had, you know, different successes uh, with um, different types of programming. The, the readiness for health plans to uh, robustly invest in the uh, in the network is, you know, I think is in, it, there is some hesitation in some parts because uh, we don't have the evidence to show yet what the uh, health, you know, health cost impact is. So I think that is, I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything. There's, there's clearly a role, Carrington, for disseminating the kinds of work that Elena has been doing. Um, you know, the, at the federal level, health policy has been heavily litigated over the past 10 or so years, and it's been hard to do innovative stuff. And what we're seeing is most of those innovations happen at the state or the county level, just like Elena's doing. And what I'm seeing here in the questions is a, a, a strong thirst for more information of like, how did this happen? How did people you know, get this thing off the ground and, and how's it functioning? Um, and I don't know if there's a way to push that back to RWJ is to say, we really need to learn from these counties and these states that are doing really innovative work. Both. I see you're coming off on mute. Oh, I was just going to, there's a follow-up question that I'll, I'd like to direct to Elena that just came in. How does the IPA financially support itself? Are the MCOs willing to contract with the funding stream going to the IPA? So I know, I know from discussion that this is in transition, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about where the initial funding came from and where you are now. Yeah, so the initial funding came from uh, the district labor program. And um, right now, you know, we're still using some of those funds. I think that the, there have been some contracts with, um, as I mentioned, with different payers in our region. And yet the willingness is still, you know, the willingness and the promise for, um, for the full investment is a little bit lagging. And so I think this is where policy, um, both at the state and federal level, could facilitate such uh, uh, funding streams because um, you know, right now there's still a, a, a bit of a hesitation. Thank you. Okay, let me find another question here. We had one, um, Elena, that you've answered already, but I'm going to ask again about um, how do your CBO and behavioral health partner agencies and health alliance get credit for helping clients meet social needs? So talking a little bit about your funding distribution system in, in those cases. Yeah, so right now, um, you know, we uh, folks have access to referrals in the network. Not every referral gets a uh, payment. Um, and, you know, you don't get a payment for every referral that you make into, um, the, so the CBOs are not getting funding for every single referral, nor are the behavioral health providers. I mean, behavioral health providers get 
can bill for some of their services. Um, so we have tried, however, there we have do have some programs that are funded. And so we have tried different things like um, during COVID, we provided um, like a, almost like a fee for service or, you know, just a small amount to help our the orgs provide the services through COVID. Um, we found that that wasn't as, um, you know, or organizations can't really rely on that kind of funding stream. And so now we're moving more towards like a case rate. Um, and so this is under development. It's, you know, we're trying to sort out what have other folks done and kind of develop a new system for payment as we, we have the opportunity to actually pay our social care providers in the future. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, our next question. Um, what short-term social outcomes have been interesting or meaningful to your MCOs? So to begin with, um, you know, even things like tracking the referrals was, um, you know, getting, getting organizations onboarded onto our, the network, um, tracking that the referrals were being made, that people were meeting the network standards for closure, for resolution of the referrals, meaning that the needs were met for the individual. And then, you know, again, those are process measures um, for the network. Um, and then, you know, for example, we have one of the food as medicine programs, you know, there's a lot of interest in food insecurity. So has that resolved as a result of, um, of the program? Um, and, you know, we're working on developing a whole framework for the IPA. Measure I can things. speak to that from an organizational level as well, like from, you know, the community side to be, you know, trying to address some of the social determinants of health with a client outside of what your program provides to see that referral go through and to see that being taken care of then allows you to better provide the services you can provide because all the other barriers are kind of being addressed within the network and you can see that communicate that with the individual in front of you and also you know work collaboratively with other cbos to continue to meet those needs so it's a definitely an immediate benefit um, from our side as well Um, why did you increase the counties served from seven to 22 and how many food and housing CBOs signed an IPA contract? I'm guessing that's controlled. Um, so to answer your first question, I think we're trying to um, leverage some of the lessons learned. Um, and so we've actually, we're collaborating with folks in central New York and up in the Adirondacks um, and so it, it just allows for more visibility into the network. And I, again, um, uh, you know, some of the things that we learned in terms of performance management data and all of that, we could extend um, to other regions as well. And the second part of the question was about how many CBOs? Um, how many food and housing CBOs have signed an IPA contract? Uh, whew. Uh, I, don't the, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but we definitely have a representation of um, housing and food in, in, in all our regions. It's one of the very active, you know, I think we have very active in terms of emergency housing and emergency food, as well as other lots of food programs. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how the group envisions distributing a portion of Medicaid dollars to CBOs um, when addressing social needs? Yeah, so I, I think, again, this is under development, back to the conversation a little bit about um, how we develop uh, maybe case rates or how we distribute that funding, I think is going to take some time um, to develop and is probably going to, um, again, we're, we're experimenting with different ways to do that. We actually, because we are governed by our um, social care providers, we also get, you know, feedback, immediate feedback from our partners about what's working and what's not working. So it's a collaborative development. Um, let's see, I'm scrolling down a little bit to a question from an anonymous attendee. Will the cost of provided social care be included in the total cost of health care? And Todd, I believe you just answered that one via text. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so the data that we're going to be using from Sparks, this all pair claims database, is paid claims. And so to the degree that someone submitted a claim and it was paid by uh, an insurer for that, um, we'll see it. 
but I, I suspect that there are no claims for diapers. Um, I suspect there's few, if any, claims for transportation. I suspect what we're going to see, the majority of these claims are going to be outpatient visits like e &M codes, these evaluation and management codes that happen on an ambulatory basis. That's the very typical code that a primary care provider will make. We'll probably see a lot of claims for emergency services. Um, the most expensive claims, of course, will be the inpatient stays. And so um, they may not be the most uh, quantitatively um, uh, dense, but they'll be expensive. And so we'll sort of have to play around with that in statistical analysis. But to answer your question, I think largely you're, we're not going to see those types of services being paid by the medical care system. Thank you. And I, I guess the one thing I would add also um, is, you know, we're hoping to offer what we call a horizontal offering. So like, again, a diverse, right now, up until now, our funding has been more program-based, um, but really the diverse array of services in this way that maybe um, one of the options is also could be that the funding goes through the MCOs and then somehow they pay like a rate towards the net for the network, like, a, you know, um, so that I don't I don't know, again, how, how that's all going to pan out. But that's one of the ways we're thinking about would be ideal, at least so that then we can par start providing um, funding to the social care providers in our network. Um, Todd, I see you're answering another one. This is actually the one I was going to ask next. So this question comes from John Freeman, and they ask, can you speak to the data sharing agreements um, and, and infrastructure among the participating organizations? Do you want to take a first stab at that since you're answering it now and then others can jump in? It was actually a clarification. There's two sets of data use agreements, and I suspect John is mostly interested in what's happening on the ground with Healthy Alliance, not what's happening between us and Healthy Alliance because we've spent the past two months working with Stanford lawyers and their lawyers about data use sharing agreements because we need to share our data too. Um, but I suspect what, they're, what John really is interested in is sort of the standard platform for Healthy Alliance. And, and John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Elena, do you want to speak to that? You know, I, I so, um... Yeah, so there are, you know, again, we're working, one of the goals is really to connect the different um, data sets. So, you know, in this particular project, we have the benefit of working with um, the Stanford research team and the, the Sparks data set, I think, in some other ways, we'd like to connect with our regional health information exchange. And so that's one of the things that we're working on in terms of how do we, how do we bring more visibility to the, these public health data sets, including the social care data sets. And we do have, um, you know, consents for the usage of Unite Us. And so um, as far as the identified information and stuff like that, we can look at that for, um, to look at the performance metrics. And then once someone's getting services from a health plan, you know, that's, that's as it relates to, um, uh, payment. And so then again, you can share data in that way, but all of these data issues are parts, part of what we as a trusted broker are trying to sort out. And it's not super easy as, as you pointed out, um, by asking the question. Alan, do you have any experience from your side of the aisle here on how the data sharing works for a member? Yeah, so you know, consent is required for participation in the platform. So anytime we're entering in a new client, the client is aware that they are being entered into the platform as a new client and that their information will be shared with any organization that they're being referred to. Um, so there's you know different ways that we can exhibit that consent, whether it be verbal consent, written consent, but there are, you know, that lives in the platform under the client's profile. So it's really a limited amount of personal information that's required in Unite Us. Um, and because it's used as a referral system and not a case management system, there aren't like case note style, you know, information being shared between organizations. It's really just the pertinent information in order to send the referral for a specific need to a specific organization. I can't go in and see, you know, even if it's my client, I can't see much more than what they might have been referred to for another organization. And I can't see the details of that. So it's really closed between the organization sending and receiving that particular referral. The only thing that's really kind of available to everyone to see all of the providers is just what the referral was. 
if that answers the question. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Seems like it's very helpful, Kyla. Um, this question, I think I'm going to address towards Elena. It's from Kim. They ask, uh, or they say that they're interested in whether Healthy Alliance and its work has been confronted with the following two challenges, one being capacity issues in the social care sector, and two is uh, operational challenges because of closed referral systems. Um, okay, so to answer the first question, as, as I said, we do, we do, one of the biggest areas that we struggle with is, um, you know, permanent housing and also uh, behavioral health you know, those are always seem to be um, in high demand. And so, um, you know, in general, again, we, we track the, the network, we track how quickly um, the referrals are um, addressed and people get their needs, need, their, um, needs met. Um, and so when we start seeing that in a particular area, this is slowing down, um, you know, we, we seek other, other programs, other organizations. Um, the second question was operational question regarding the closed loop referral. I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Let's see. Happy to get more contact and fake contacts in which I work. This person says many of the most intense social services must go through state agencies. Um, I guess it doesn't provide ah. context, but. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's that's a very great that's a great point. Is that um, we don't necessarily have visibility into the social services that are provided by the government. So, in an ideal case, you know, we seek out a model of like a public utility where we can actually have visibility into not only the community social care organization work, but also the social services provided by the government, so that um, we don't create these silos. We don't have these silos that exist currently. If you have more questions, we can, you know, always share emails and contact us. We can make sure we do that in our follow-up email. But thank you for addressing that. Um, let's see here. We've got about eight minutes left and may not have time to answer all questions. So I'm just scrolling through. Are there any questions that the team has seen that they really want to address? Uh, so Karen, there's a couple questions about the referral completion. Uh, and there's actually a really nice uh, answer. So I got... I answered partially one question, just showing how many referrals, for, I think it's on one of our slides, around 2,000 a month. Um, but the question is more about what percentage of those actually then are completed. And, and Lauren Wetterhan, had a, uh, who is one of the Healthy Alliance's partners, was kind enough to volunteer that in, in their experience um, with Healthy Alliance in Q4 of 2021, 62% of the referrals sent within the Unitas were accepted by an agency and 55% of those accepted were resolved. Um, meaning it was delivered or also uh, resolved includes uh, the client declining. So I don't know if Elena, you want to talk more broadly about, you know, if that is representative of, of the referral sort of closed loop completion. Um, I assume it really varies, you know, region to region and county to county. Yeah. So thank you um, for sharing that in the chat. Um, we, you know, I think that what was shown there was really interesting is that we do have that snapshot of, because it's closed loop referral, we do have that ability to check in on our referral status and how quickly are things getting addressed and how well they are, the needs are being met. Um, and so that's, you know, there's a wide range. I think we we generally, you know, again, for specifics, happy to, to let you know, we're, depends on the county, depends on the service type. So there are going to be some service types that are going to be, you know, a lot lower, but in general, it's, closer to 70% in some of the counties. And then you're gonna see some of the newer counties that are joining our, our, our um, IPA um, may have you know, different resolution rates, if that's what we call it. So um, happy to share more information, uh, specific information offline if that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks Jonathan for bringing that question to our attention. And thank you to Lauren for helping answer that question. I'm glad you're able to join us today. Um, let's see here. There's a question I saw a moment ago about, let's see, how do you, how are you approaching inoperability challenges? How do you support CBO partners or others that are already using multiple case management or referral systems that may be required from other funders? Great question. And I'd love Kayla's, uh, uh, if, if she had any input, you're welcome to provide as well. Do you want to, sure. is there anything? 
Yeah. So as I mentioned before, it's not a case management platform. So it does differ there. I mean, we do have a case management platform we use internally, and we do have the ability to, you know, use it to give access to other partnering organizations to leave case notes and things of that nature. Um, but the Unitas platform is really primarily for sending and receiving referrals. And it also is just for, you know, connecting with other CBOs in your network to know what's available and to be able to better meet the needs of your clients that are outside of your services. So it's really, um, I guess the best word would be a convenience more than a hassle in terms of having the access to the system, because as I mentioned, you know, when you have someone in front of you that has a bunch of different areas of concern or a bunch of different barriers, able to have that conversation and find out what those other ones might be and have a one-stop shop to address them in the moment is more convenient than anything else. Um, and because it's closed loop, we can see exactly what happens. So it's not the end of the conversation, it's the beginning, but it's very, um, you know, we've developed relationships with other organizations that do somewhat similar work. For example, there's an organization, uh, Healthy Families, that does home visits, but they're really focused on the child's development, but they're in the home with the same demographic of individuals that we serve. But when you are focused on the child's development and well-being, if mom or dad are having some struggles, they're going to hear about it when they're in the home. But their role is not to address those struggles of the parents. They're there to address the child. So they'll shoot off a referral to us. We'll follow up and then we'll be able to work with the parent on an ongoing basis. And then healthy families can do what they're there to do without having to feel like they are kind of ignoring the emergent needs of the parent because it's not their primary focus. So examples like that, um, it's really beneficial to us as organizations to have a place to send um, our clients that we can follow up with and then know that they'll be taken care of, or at least know that there isn't a solution, right? It's kind of, um, it is a solution in the moment, right? To know that if there is some organization locally that can help, then the network will kind of resolve that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, you know, in regards to the interoperability, I think that that's one of the reasons why having a single closed loop referral platform in the, in a large region is helpful because if you have multiple closed loop referral platforms, then you have a real struggle with how do you get, you know, in some areas we've seen where there's two different closed loop referral platforms and then different healthcare organizations are functioning with each. And then the CBOs have to figure out who to work with. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of interoperability issues with, you know, the, once you're working with different sectors and, and all of that is, is um, again, there think there's policies and stuff that could, could, could work to enhance that um, and to remove some of those barriers. Thank you. And Kyla, I really appreciate that tangible um, example. It's extremely helpful. So I think we have time for maybe one more question, if we can do it quickly. Is there one that the research team really wants to answer here that you feel like you can address in a in about two minutes. If not, I have one chosen. Okay, I see no one's coming off of unmute. So I'm gonna ask one that came in from an anonymous attendee. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you increase adoption of the referral platform by CBOs? So um, we've used different strategies. I think um, providing funding for you know, building the capacity to do it, you know, just getting folks on board and also helping, um, you know, develop the workflows and all of that has been really helpful. So um, that has been one of the, the ways we've done it. We have a performance team that helps, again, with um, each individual community organization and other orgs to help uh, really create a plan and, um, and figure out how best to support the organization you know, whether it's a healthcare organization or, or a social care organization. Great, thank you. So with one minute left, I'm gonna go ahead and close this out for today. Um, Jonathan, would you mind advancing one slide? 
So we do offer a certi our certificate of completion to everyone that joined today. So as soon as this webinar is over, we'll you'll be sent to a, a quick Qualtrics survey to talk about your experience today and what you've learned. And, um, and you can indicate if you'd like a certificate of completion. And if you indicate yes, we'll get that to you in a timely manner. And then as I mentioned at the top of, of the hour today, we do record this session and we'll send out the recording and slides. And I'll also get the unanswered questions to our research team and see if they have some answers and we can share that in a follow-up email as well. But I wanna thank you for joining today. I wanna thank the research team for putting this presentation together and telling us a little bit more about their project. And as I mentioned, this is their first research in progress webinar and they'll continue to do some over their three years that they'll have um, with us at Systems for Action. So definitely stay tuned so that you can uh, stay connected to this project. But thank you again and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.